Hey, it's me Kurt, and today we're looking at the second part of my SPWM series. Uh, in the first video, we looked at some fixed frequency SPWM code. Today, we're looking at variable frequency, and in the next video, we're bumping up to the Mega 2560 and looking at a three phase SPWM signal. Well, this isn't quite correct. So, I've been sitting on this video nearly completely edited for at least a month because I wanted to have the code for the next video ready before I uploaded this one. And I ran, did, ran into some trouble with the three phase code, and I'm lacking motivation at the moment. So anyway, I would like to make a follow up video to this one, but it may not happen. If it does happen, it will either be as stated, the three phase code, or it will be a variable frequency code with a PID loop in it so that it can sync up with main power supply. Cool. All of the, uh, all this code is available on GitHub, you can find a link in the description. And the explanation for this uh, video uh, depends heavily on the last video, so you might want to check that out first. Alright, let's have a quick look at the SPWM signal. So here you can see I can vary the frequency and the amplitude of the sine width with each of these pot meters, respectively. Also, if I lower the filtering on the RC filter, you can see the switching frequency changes back and forth. It's going from 5 to 15 kHz. That's just to demo that all three properties can be changed on the fly without disrupting the output. Fancy. So where we left off, or how the fixed frequency code worked, is we generated a lookup table for our sine wave, and then we changed the duty cycle um, by changing the output compare values every period of the PWN. So basically we had our sine wave divide up, divided up into many increments, and everything matched up with the frequency of the PWN and the number of divisions, so that by incrementing through the lookup table once every PWN period, gave us our output at the right frequency. The way we're going to implement a variable frequency SPWM is by incrementing through our lookup table at different intervals. I.e., if we jump two entries of the lookup table every period, then the sine wave output will be at double the frequency. Therefore, our method for varying the sine wave frequency is by varying how quickly we increment through our lookup table. One other thing we need to take into consideration in the code is that we want to be able to use a number with decimal places for our increment through the lookup table. Because if we use only integers, then it will result in set frequencies, a series of set frequencies instead of a continuous spectrum. And the code has a clever way of doing this efficiently. In terms of varying the switching frequency, I've actually uploaded two versions of this code that implement it differently, each with their pros and cons, but I'll uh, get to that at the end of the video. For now, let's have a look at the code. So the code we're looking at is called SVWM Variable Frequency 1. Uh, obviously this code is very similar to the code from the last video since it was built from that, but one thing I've done is put everything into their own functions so that if you wanted to use this code yourself, my code shouldn't clutter everything and you can use uh, these functions with your own logic without having to worry about their implementation too much. Kind of library-ish. So the three functions I've got here are set freak, set switch freak and register init. Register init being the simplest, it just loads values into registers to set up our PWM the way we want it. <coughs> My explanation from here jumps around a little bit, but I think it's the best way to explain it. So first we're going to have a look at how the lookup table is generated, which is done with a for loop incrementing for the value of our lookup entries, which is 512. It's important to note here um, that it only generates half of the sine wave up to pi or 180 degrees. If you wanted to generate the whole sine wave, you would have sine i times 2 pi divided by 512, so that when i finally equals 512, you get sine 2 pi or 1. We only want half the sine wave, so we want to double 512. Notice the 2's cancel out, and we're left with what we have in the code. The sine function is times by the period, so the lookup table varies from 0 to period instead of 0 to 1, and we round it and load it into the lookup table. One other thing worth noting here is that while our lookup table is 500, 512 entries long, this means we have a total of 1024 divisions or points along the sine wave since we only generated half of the sine wave in our lookup table. We'll get back to the rest of this function later, but now we're going to have a look at the function set freak. Essentially all this function does is take a frequency value, check it within an acceptable range, and if so it changes the global variable to match. Then it calculates phase increment by multiplying the frequency value by a variable phase inc mult. Here phase inc determines how many entries will jump through the lookup table at a time and thereby determine the frequency. 
but what is phase ink molt exactly? Well, it's calculated down here, but let's take a moment to see how it's calculated more abstractly. So we have our sine wave output, which has frequency freak, and this is generated by our dynamic PWM, which has its own frequency, the switching frequency, SF. We can determine what fraction each period of the PWM is responsible for their sine output by dividing the two, F over, F over SF. So let's say they are 10 kHz and 50. This gives us 0 0.005. This means that each period of the PWM is responsible for this fraction of the total sign output. Okay, so next we need to determine how many values we need to jump in our lookup table each period of the PWM. And that is as simple as timing the fraction by the amount of divisions we have in our lookup table. Remember, this is actually 1024 and not 512 since the lookup table only contains half of the sign rate. This gives us 5.12 entries of the lookup table need to be skipped every time. We're not going to discuss it right now, but just remember that this number actually has decimal places and how we might deal with that. So now we know how to calculate how many entries to skip in our phase increment. But to make it a little more specific to the micro, the switching frequency of the PWM is determined by dividing the period of the PWM by the clock speed of the micro. Now I'm going to write this out a little differently and now it pretty much matches what we have in the code if we were to take all this and condense it into one line. Although I hard-coded hard this number because I'm lazy. Um, but other than that, the difference between this code and what I've written is the use of the variable phasing malt and the number 2 to the power of 23. So what is 2 to the power of 23? Well, this is a little trick we're doing and it's related to our lookup table. Remember that it has 512 uh, entries. 512 is 2 to the power of 9 or 9 bits. And there are some perks to using a number that is 2 to the power of something. Namely, here it is really handy for dealing with overflows. For example, let's say our 9 bit number currently equals 500, and then we add 24. The number would overflow and we're left with 12. But notice how it resets itself while keeping the remainder. This is great for us. However, one problem with this is that there is no 9 bit data type. But that isn't too much of a big deal in fact. We can purposely use the top bits of a larger bit number so that it still overflows and this explains the 2 to the power of 23. By timing um, our number by 2 to the power of 20 feet, 23, this effectively shifts the number up 23 bits and with our 9 bit number that leaves us with a 32 bit number which is why we're using unsigned long int. Another benefit of this is that all of those lower bits become decimal places. Remember earlier when I was doing those caps on paper and how a 10 kHz switching frequency outputting a 50 Hz sine wave would skip 5.12 entries in our lookup table at a time? Well now we know how to deal with the decimal places like this and therefore not develop rounding errors. If we had no way to use the decimal places we would end up with code that allowed very set frequencies but not a continuous spectrum like I said earlier. So um, what we're doing is good. So to look back at where we originally set off in set freak function, here the phase ink malt is a number that makes up all of the calculations so that if it's just simply multiplied by the frequency, it gives us the correct phase increment to give us set frequency. And this is cast to unsung long int. Putting all this into one variable, phase ink malt, is good for efficiency. Alright, now we'll have a look at the interrupt service routine where phase increment is used. The ISR is called every period of the PWM and this gives us a chance to change the duty cycle in order to output our sine wave. In the code from the last video, we step through the lookup table one entry at a time. This time we're jumping through at different amounts. So here our variable phase holds the current position that the sine wave is through its cycle and we increment that by adding phase ink to it each ISR call. Skipping this whole middle section, for now, we'll jump straight to where our lookup table is loaded into the output compare registers. If you're unfamiliar with these dual greater than signs, it's a shift operator. So here we are throwing away the, 20, the bottom 23 bits to leave us with just the top 9 as we discussed earlier. The um, double greater than 23 is the opposite of multiplying by 2 to the power of 23 from earlier. The if statement in the ISR is there to toggle the output compares on and off in order to split the signal across two pins. So this statement is basically asking if the counter has overflowed. 
if the last bit in phase is different from the last phase and the last bit in phase is low, then it has overflowed. And we, we toggle pin 13 for oscilloscope triggering reasons. But we also increment this delay one variable. This is so that um, the next ISR core delay will be greater than one and we will then disconnect one of the pins and connect the other by using this XOR pattern and uh, loading that into TCCR1A. We will, and then we'll reset delay one. This part is explained in more detail in the last video, but essentially why we delay disconnecting and connecting the pins by one ISI call is because the values in the output compare register are buffered. So we need to, to delay changing the register TCCR1A so that disconnecting the pins and the lookup table resetting happen at the same time. Then phase is loaded into last phase, ready for the next ISI call. The only thing left to explain is a set switch freak function, which I've already covered much of anyway. This function changes the switching frequency of a PWM, but in doing so the lookup table must be regenerated. So here the value given to the function is checked that it is in range, and if it is then the global variable is updated. Then the period of the PWM is calculated. After this we want to stop the PWM while we update the lookup table. So global interrupts are disabled and we also disconnect the two output compare values. The period is loaded into ICR1 and then we generate the lookup table which we've already covered. After this phase ink mult and phase ink are calculated which have also been covered, then we reconnect the two output compares and re-enable global interrupts now that the lookup table has been updated. And that's it. You can put whatever you want in the loop. Here I've got some code that changes the frequency depending on what is read on the analog pins or so uh, pot meter can be connected. But yeah, that's it. I hope you understand and let's have a look at the next bit of code. Now this code allows for the frequency, the switching frequency and the amplitude to be changed like I showed at the start of the video. However, it uses a different method that means that the lookup table does need to be regenerated every time the switching frequency is changed. So let's jump in and I'll explain the, uh, the differences. Uh, so the code we're looking at is called SPWM variable freak 2. So there are two new functions, set amp for changing the amplitude and make lookup as the lookup table is no longer calculated in the set switch freak function. And the order they are called here in the setup is a pretty good order to go through them. So similar to code we were looking at previously, global interrupts and output pins are disconnected and then reconnected after the lookup table has been generated. In regards to the lookup table, the only difference is that the sign function is no longer multiplied by the period of the PWM but instead multiplied by 4096 or 2 to the power of 12. We'll get to this later, but one thing to keep in mind is that by multiplying it by 4096, it means that the values in the lookup table will vary from 0 to 4096. Okay, set switch freak. First, the global variable is updated, and then the period is calculated, and then this is loaded into ICR1. And that's all that needs to be done to change the switching frequency as it is ICR1 that determines the PWM frequency. However, we also do this, which is related to the frequency of the sine wave. The reason we are calculating this is because changing the switching frequency will change the sine frequency as well. This is because phase ink is how many entries the lookup table will skip um, each ISR call. But if the ISR is called twice as often, then the sine output will increase by two as well. So we need to recalculate it. These two calculations are exactly the same as the code we were looking at last. The set freak function is exactly the same as the last code and so is register init. The last function to look at is set amp and it simply takes underscore amp a number given as a, given as a percentage and maps it to a 10 bit number and that's all there is to it. Okay let's take a look at the interrupt service routine. It is exactly the same as the ISR from the last bit of code except for this one line. So what's happening in this line is what makes it possible to change the switching frequency and the amplitude on the fly without having to regenerate the lookup table. So this bit, of, uh, so this bit is the same as before but remember the lookup table varies from 0 to 4096 not from 0 to period like it did in the last code. So in order to normalize it back so it does vary from 0 to period we first times it by the period and then shift it down 12 bits, um, that being the 12 bits cancelling the 4096. This method is giving us the same effect of multiplying the period by a number that varies between 0 and 1. 
but the benefit of doing it this way is that it's much, much more efficient as we don't have to use any floating bit number calculations. Now this last bit uses the same trick. The number is multiplied by amp, which is a number that varies from 0 to 24, which is, uh, sorry, 0 to 1024, which is to say from 0 to 2 to the power of 10. And then it is shifted down 10 bits, effectively dividing it back by 1024. Conceptually, what's happening in this part is we're making sure that the number loaded into the Apple Compare varies between zero and the period of the PWM. And this bit of code can collectively drop the pulse width so that as to lower the amplitude of the output. And all of this is done efficiently enough to be done 20,000 or so times a second. So that's it. I'll quickly show you what I'm doing in the loop, but the code here is really for demo purposes and you can do whatever you like. So all that is happening here is I have a pot meter connected to pin AO and I use that to vary the sign frequency between 5 and 300 and then I print uh, phasing to see how many entries have been skipped. Another pot meter is connected to pin A1 and I use this value to change the amplitude which is also printed. And lastly I have a bit of code here that changes the switching frequency between 5 and 15 kilohertz every 2 seconds or so. Basically, just so I can view all three things changing on the oscilloscope at once. So now to quickly compare the two versions of code. Now while the second code does have the benefit of being able to change the switching frequency on the fly, in most applications this just simply isn't necessary. And so um, by generating a lookup table to match the uh, period of the PWM so it can be loaded directly into the output compare values does have merit especially if you're doing a lot of processing elsewhere and need all the extra processing power that you can spare. So really which uh, code is better is going to depend on, its, on the, your purpose essentially. Uh, so that's it, there's no more code to explain. I hope you understood everything. Uh, this code was mostly for demo purposes, but I guess it could be used as a smarts for a uh, variable speed drive for a one phase motor. Having said that, the next video is going to be on a three phase SPWM. Mm, maybe. See the start of the video. Um, so that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.